Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Riffing with G, I am G. Uh, today's guest, if you're familiar with drums or drumming in Australia, he needs very little introduction. I'm talking about Mr. Lucius Boric. Now Lucius became most famous for his work with progressive rock band Cog, but he has played with many other acts, uh, Juice, The Hanging Tree, Floating Me, The Nerve. If there's a drum gig, he's pretty much done it. So uh, we had a pretty great chat, and uh, thanks so much for tuning in, and I'll see you real soon. All right, bye. But then it's also like doing a bit of just doing a little bit of reading. I realized that it, there's so much of like your past that I had no idea about. I didn't realize that you'd started so soon. I didn't realize that you were a child star. How good was that? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was all pretty weird. It was definitely yeah. all pretty weird. And I guess, you know, with my family, there was, there was a certain sense of entertainment, uh, you know, being in the industry. So yeah. it was kind of like a normal environment in that regard. Like my uncle, Doug Parkinson's a, a great, soul singer he's been around for forever and he's just amazing vocalist my dad uh, is a blues guitarist and um you know there was always musicians and everything like that so yep. you know that was the environment um that was pretty normal um compared to you know other friends and things like that but um yeah it definitely kind of led to to kind of getting into things um early for sure do you have a memory is there something that stands out to you that you're like you remember like your dad first talking to you about something about music or you seeing something on the TV or hearing something on the record player that, that, that just sort of kind of set you on fire for that first time or something, not even if it set you on fire, but just that you, that kind of just, it sort of stands out in your memory as being that thing of like, Ooh, what's that? Mm. I, I think the, the connection to my dad was pretty interesting because he was, he, you know, he was the, the cliche, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll rock star, you know <laughs> yep. what I mean? So his responsibilities weren't really necessarily to family. They were more to his career, you know? Yep. So, yep. you know, you could say I was one of those children at that point in time that, um, you know, suffered from that, um, yep. kind of, um, distance and things mm. like that. So my connection was to, to listen to his records Interesting. and then to play, and then to play along to the records. And then mm. that's how um i felt closer in okay. some regards yeah yeah so I'd, i would the earliest memories would be putting on those vinyl albums of his and others as well but um just playing along to them and setting up a drum kit like with cushions and and whatever <laughs> else and playing along and you know um having fun doing that and um really digging into to the, the sound and the vibe of of um you know those albums because it was very rarely that I, I I saw him in my younger years. You know he right. was he was very yeah he he would pop in and out, but yep. um, it was pretty much my mum and me and and my sister. Yeah. Um, and then there were other musicians and everything as well that were around, which was really cool and kind of helped kind of you know throw ideas and things like that. Yep. But that was kind of like the earliest I guess the earliest memory of connecting with with some music, you know, they yeah, kind of yeah. felt and really meant something, you know? Did you just make your drum kit up how you thought it should be? Or did someone show you how a drum kit goes together or? I, yeah. I'd open the, you know, the vinyl packages of the, the, yeah. the album, you know, in the credits and everything and look at the photos and look at the oh, drum yeah, kits. <laughs> and then I would copy that, you know, yeah. I'd, I'd, but, um, I didn't have a, dr I had a drum kit when I was, when I was really young, when my mum and dad were together, when I was in my, um, you know, I was about three or four. So I had a, a little drum kit that was made and created out of, you know, bits and pieces of, of you know, um, like little timbales and, and congas and cut out cymbals. And, and they did a really good job of really making a tiny little kit for a tiny little kid. Yeah, right. And I've got some photos of those. And apparently there was, um, there was also some um, recordings on, on just a cassette tape 
where I was playing four four times. So yeah, wow. I had an ability to to be able to play some drums. I don't know how, but and kind of why I was interested in that way. But um, there it was anyway. And then I did have a drum kit for a long time. But I used to when I when I I didn't have one, I'd just create things. You know, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd just make drum kits. I would air drum a lot. You know, yeah. so I just put the sticks and pretend I had a drum kit in yeah. front of me. Um, I lived in units, flats and units a lot of the time. So I couldn't really play yeah. and, you know, have loud things. So um, sometimes I'd take the mattress off my bed and I'd shape it around like a like a, a half circle and then get a big Sharpie pen and draw toms on the edge of the thing and put a cardboard box down there so I could kind of hit the edge of the, the, um, the bed yeah, or the, yeah. the mattress and then the the, the uh, snare drum would be the box in between my legs and then I'd I'd kind of stomp on the floor with my my foot which was like the kick drum and I'd, yeah, I'd wow. play along to music so um yeah I was really being as much as I could creative but list probably listening a lot more than I would be playing for sure yeah. but there was um there was definitely well, that yeah there was definitely that kind of I'm I'm a drummer I've got I've got that ability yeah. And that's what I'm going to do. And it was, I guess that's a strange thing at that young of an age to kind of recognize, recognize yeah. that. And I don't, I don't know why that is in some regards. Considering that, like my daughter's almost four now and she hasn't really like sniffed around music at all. Mm. At the moment. She loves, she loves to sing. And every time I've got the microphone set up, she wants to sing Twinkle Twinkle or whatever. But, you know, like to think about her sort of getting active when we play like uh the Lion King, she'll sometimes get like spoons out and tap on the back of the couch, but she doesn't really have a very developed sense of rhythm at the moment. But she, she loves sounds, but she's not like drawn to them just yet. So to hear that, you know, that age is pretty amazing. Yeah, now, maybe we, too with maybe too with drums, it's quite it's not as finicky as guitar or piano or violin yeah. or flute or anything. So it's pretty easy to to kind of like you know put something in your hands and start having that rhythmical kind of thing going on. Yeah, exactly. Whether you can make sense out of it or not, it's another story. But um, <laughs> you know, because my boys have my boys um, have both got they've got got the potential to have good rhythm, and and they yep. can both play drums. But and they if they applied themselves, um, they're only ten and twelve. But if yep. they I think if they applied themselves, they could actually do pretty pretty well. But you they're not really to, interested yeah. in not really interested in it. You know, it's not you know it's it's there but it's it, maybe it's a bit of like oh dad does that so you know yeah. i can't be bothered doing it or, yeah <laughs> do you remember you saying that you kept like a guitar in the house and like you every time they'd sort of get bored with you know playing around on the phone or whatever you go well, go and pick that thing up that's the thing you know and they'd go mm, they'd strum away for a while you know yeah you kind of say well you've got to do half an hour of guitar you or <laughs> half an hour of this or half an like try and break things up and try and get involved and interested in other things. Um, Believe me, it's, it's going to be worth it. Believe me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to expand the, the cognitive function, I guess, you know, Yeah, absolutely. And that's what frustrates them because it's so hard. They're on a guitar and they're trying to, you know, move from one chord to the other and it's freaking them out because they're not getting it. So they well, get upset. For me, it's, there's that, there's that period of time where you have to find I almost think of it as there's a, there's a time where certain things set your soul on fire. And for me, I'm not naturally hardworking person, but for things like, like, for example, I've tried to learn a language as an adult and I stick at it for a while, but I'm, I'm not really, there's no real reason for me to practice it. I'm not going over to another country or I'm not around other people who speak another language. So as an adult, it's really hard to do. And people say oh, the same sort of thing to me. Oh, I always wanted to learn guitar, but I never got around to it. And I'm always mm. like, well, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not a hard worker. And it just happened to be that I heard a sound. I heard ACDC or I heard Die Straits when I was 10 or something. And I just, you know, your ears prick up and you go, what is that? Mm. That, that? What is that sound? And you just, I have to know how to do that. That's just, you know, yeah. and I think that I'm, but it's, it's easy for me to be philosophical about it now, but like thinking with Ada, like I'm not sure that I want to push her towards anything specific, but I'm hoping that something catches her eye or her ear sure. and sets her soul yeah. on fire at that point. Yeah. So then she'll just go, I don't want to do anything else, but just spend time practicing this thing. And then she'll be fine. She won't need to worry about whether she's lazy or not, you know. Mm. 
How old were you in that photo that you just posted on Instagram recently? Oh, the uh, one of me side of stage, tapping on side of stage. Yeah, Yeah, I would have been 10 years old, I think, I'd say, about 10. So you had... You had some chops by that stage because I think I read you were you were out on the road already when you were fourteen. Yeah, so I left school in year nine, but yep. before year nine finished actually, so it's pretty early. Yeah, uh, I didn't want to stay on, um, and I wanted to leave because well, just just before that decision, I was in a television mainstream channel, so it was channel nine, I think. Yeah, uh, prime time you know, every week television show called Willing and Able. And I played a part of a street kid in, the, in this show. And I so that Parramatta Jones, Parramatta Jones. Yeah, that, that's right. So, and when I, I got that part, because I, I, I had no intention of acting or having anything to do with acting at all. But my grand, my, um, my um, uncle wrote the song and sung the song. Well, he wrote the song, I think for the, for the actual um, the theme song for the show. And they were looking to cast someone and, and uh, they couldn't find anyone and they were telling him and he said, well, you know, for some reason I popped into his head and he said, well, what about I, I bring my nephew down? And um, so, you know, we got the call and I went down and and I was just kind of obviously having fun with it, not thinking yep. anything, obviously, you know, like this is ridiculous. What am, what am I even doing here? But they were like, oh, you know, this would be a good experience, you know. So I went along and, and I thought nothing of it when it finished and the phone rang a couple of days later and I got the part. <laughs> and it was like, and I kind of, I remember like break, I was only 13, I think 13 or 14, I broke down crying, devastated because I was in shock at what I was going to have to do in terms of like, you know, uh, having to read scripts, you yep. know, acting, you know, um, being in front of a camera, um, all these type of things I'd never done and never wanted to do and knew what that, what it was like. Cause when you watch television, you watch other people acting and it was like, yeah, yeah. but anyway, um, my parents kind of, you know, they, 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 my mum was like, well, just, just go for it and see what happens. You'll be fine. You know? Yep. So that really upset a lot of my schooling. Because I was doing that a lot of the time, you know, pretty much for a whole year or a year and a half. Um, and basically, by the time I got to year nine, my, my whole schooling curriculum was out of whack. Yeah. And before that, it was even out of whack because it was such a turbulent time with my family and my, my parents that, um, you know, school was really, you know, it was lacking a lot of... Um, coercion or, or integrity or, or continuity, yeah. you know? So I didn't, I didn't really get a good grounding solid, uh, base of, of schooling. So when I got to year nine, I knew what I wanted to do musically and all the rest of it. I got out of the acting thing. I, they wanted me to pursue that. I actually, <laughs> funnily enough, I got the, I got the part for home and away, believe it or not, <laughs> to be in that show and be one of the main characters, but I turned it down. I didn't want to be part of it. Um, I just wanted to play drums. I just, I just wanted to move forward and play drums. And, um, and so when I got back to school, um, it was hopeless. And then I just turned around to, to my parents and I said, look, I, I want to, I want to leave, you know, I, I, it's just not working out. Um, there was an opportunity to play for a band, you know, um, not just leave school and go to nothing. Um, yeah. it was actually to pick up uh, work, you know, so I was like 15, 16, I think or 16, yeah. 17 maybe. And, uh, I did a fill in for a cover band, which was a Rolling Stones cover band called the Rolling Clones. And that had Mark Evans from ACDC on bass and Mick Cox from Rose Tattoo on guitar. Yeah. Wow. And I was about 17, 18. I think we play, I played the Caring Bar Inn, I think it was, in, down Cronulla there in Sydney. And um, I filled in for the guy who wasn't there. They really liked the playing. They probably liked the fact that I was probably not going to cost as much as the other guy because I was younger. <laughs> Oops. Um, so they asked me if I wanted to play. So I actually left school um, and went straight into playing in that group for like two years. Jesus, that's a great um, way to work. Cut your teeth. 
Yeah. So, but the funny thing was, obviously, it was Rolling Stones music. So, yeah. Charlie Watts is not the uh, not the most accomplished drummer in the world, I guess. Well, at, 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 he's a brilliant and amazing drummer in his own right. But um, you know, being all of fifteen, sixteen, getting into guys like Billy Cobham and Vinnie Colaiuta, mm. <laughs> like all these chop players, you know, it was like going into playing the Rolling Stones. Very disciplined, very simple. Yeah, you know, it was just it was a complete mismatch. You know, See, that's, it was, that's in also some that's regards. But... Oh, totally. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lesson though that it takes a long time for people to learn. So it's it's almost kind of good that you were forced into it at a young age and and playing with those older guys who probably wouldn't let you chop out either too much. To be just like, boy, play it straight. And you're like, and that's curve. right. And yeah, and if I did, you know, I'd turn around and go like. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> like it's, you just have to go shut do the boom boom. You know, that's all you instead of brutta brutta the brutta brutta. So so um you know that was two years and that was that was really you know joyful and it was really eye opening because it was you know we were playing bikey shows and we were touring mm-hmm. New Zealand and going to Maori clubhouses and you know big these venues. It was all really rock and roll stuff, you know. And yeah, yeah. And I was very naive and, and I, I witnessed and saw a lot and it was very confronting in many respects. <laughs> but um, other than that, you know, it was just a joy to play drums and to be paid for playing drums. And it was really part of my, uh, I guess, uh, start of my journey, you know, knowing that, okay, well, this is what I can do. This is what I'm going to do. Uh, and that was the first kind of real employment, you know, in terms of working and playing. Do you think of anything that you learnt in that band that you brought forward into other bands and stuff, do you reckon? Definitely things not what to do <laughs> out yeah, of yeah. playing on stage with yeah. people, you know, acting and, you know, doing things, obviously, when they're when they're on substances. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> so there was a bit of that I learnt to stay away from. <laughs> um, apart, uh, you know, playing-wise, you know, they were all really great players, you know. Yep. And the the way the music was delivered was was very you know it was pretty integral to the Rolling Stones. It, it wasn't trying to you know really reshape it or or whatever. Yeah. It was really straight down the line. So, if anything, it um it gave me a real base to just be consistent because you yeah. were working five you know five nights a week pretty much four to five nights a week. And then on the road as well. And then on the road, yeah. So it is, yeah. Wow. Is that somewhere that had you done some shows with your dad prior to that? Yeah, basically in and out. I'd, I'd, you know, he would he would get me to play with him. Um, yeah. My first, my first time on stage, playing in front of an audience on on a proper stage with a big PA with a big drum kit, was a band called the Party Boys, which my father was in, and um, the yeah. drummer was the yeah. It was a it was a mix match of it was like a super group. So. They would have, you know, big stars fronting the band, singing the band, um, or, yep. you know, playing instruments in the band. And the drummer at the time was Don Perry uh, from Jethro Tull, who ended up playing with Dragon, doing um, an album with them. And he's like six foot eight or something. He's hmm. so tall. So here comes this little, you know, 13 year old on stage. And I get up and funnily enough, I played a Rolling Stones song. There you go. I just, yeah, it was <laughs> called The When the Whip Comes Down. So it was the first song I ever played. When the whip comes down on stage, yeah. big PA, thumping that kick drum, going straight into it with, you know, five, six hundred people there. And it was I think that was one of those magical moments that was yeah. just kind of like awe inspiring. Like the I think that what, what what was interesting was the power that I felt that I had in terms of delivering sound and and, yeah. and making someone feel good, like looking out and seeing the audience just like loving it you know, yeah. and, and just dancing and enjoying themselves. And, but the power that was coming through the electricity and the amps and the, the, the fall back and the PA and how just, it was just so big. It's nothing that I had experienced. So it was, it was like, wow, you can, this is a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs> and people are, are really enjoying themselves. So, I mean, if that's not, you know, getting absolutely sucked in, oh. uh, that, that was pretty much the moment that um yeah and then there was a few other times where i played off and on and uh, did gigs with with my father and and things like that um yeah jamming with schoolmates and stuff as well yeah i I, when i got into high school 
uh, like that year seven, year eight period before I broke off into that television show, there were some great players that I was playing with. And I still play with um, some of them now. So, I mean, I've got a band called Juice that I've been in for a long, long yep. time. And, and um, like when I was 21, um, we, we, we formed a band or I joined their band called Juice. But they were like, they were my friends that I grew up with when I was like two or three. So yep. we're talking, wow. you know, or three or four or something. And, you know, we were playing dinosaurs with d plastic dinosaurs on rocks and, you know, yep. and stuff like that. But they both became, Krishna and Amanath became incredibly accomplished musicians and songwriters yep. and, and, and incredible players. So we've had a relationship for, you know, 45 years and, and, and we're still we're still doing and making music. And so you're doing something now? Have you got something currently? Yeah, yeah, with, with, with them. Yeah. Um, we're we're kind of remixing a, an old album that we did that we recorded that was done to to two inch tape which was really great the songs are really cool but we yeah. never really liked the mix so we because now i you know run a studio and and krishna's also good at you know um the softwares and using you know music yeah. production and mixing and all that type of stuff we just thought we would do a project where we would re in um you know reinvent it to to some degree in terms of the, obviously the sound but also have a look at, you know, sections of the music, you know, maybe, um, you know, cut some fat out of it or, or add yeah. a section or put some new instrumentation into it in some regards. I'm not overdoing it, but just yeah. approaching it in a different way where we're really looking at old songs, but kind of rehashing them and giving them a little fresh edge. So Dumping them all into tools and stuff. Sorry, mate? Dumping them all into tools and they're just working Yeah, yeah. So off yeah. two-inch tape into tools and then, you know, I'm basically what's happening, I'm mixing like the drums mm -hmm. uh, side of it and then I'll, I'll get all that mixed and sounding and sounding good and I'll throw other ideas if I have other ideas for things, vocals or, you know, keyboard parts, whatever else, percussion, yep. and then send them to Krish and he'll, he'll do the other, you know, um, the guitars, the bass and, you know, mix it up and then we send it off to mastering. So, yeah, yeah. it's been a really fun fun project and the songs are yeah. really good and i really like the songs you know i really enjoyed recording them at rocking horse studios like a long time like 20 years ago almost i think it was <laughs> yeah it's a long time ago so it's, it's a bit strange to be digging up something that's 20 years old and you know but i think all in all what's really special about it is the camaraderie and the um just the relationship you know between mm -hmm. the friendship is is there's an excuse to be friends we're all parents we've all got other things going on yep. but that excuse yep. to kind of connect through music is a is a, is a great thread mm. you know you feel like you've rebuilt a bit of the relationship with your dad though when you're when you play with him then or something did that something happen did something like that happen later on you know um, you it's a very good question and it's it, it's bounced you know that that has been pretty sensitive you know off and on through my life you know there's been times where it's 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 felt really good and then other times where it's just it's it's really bad yeah um so but the one thing that's you know that's that's been quite special with, with the relationship is that there's been times where we've played music together yeah and apart from anything else that's gone on um where we've either disagreed or, or whatever um you know it's it's that at least is is, is something that's kind of um special to both of us yeah, I had, I had some, some something of a similar kind of upbringing to yourself, but not my dad never really, I was obviously ever reached the sort of level that your dad did. But um, he played in bands the entire time growing up, and and I think he was still he had a lot of the same things. He was enamoured of the idea of of the rock star life, and we were out in the country, so he had less of an opportunity to pursue these things. But you know, he was still like he didn't. I don't think he was happy about being a family man per se, and. I think our relationship really suffered and we played in bands together for a little while after I finished high school. And then, um, but we didn't, we never really established good communication between each other. And then um, on his 60th birthday, I was looking to, I wanted to write him, write him a song. So it didn't, wasn't very flush with cash. I thought I'd write a song and all the things that I, um, I tried writing end up being kind of like snarky little things, you know, like, and I, I thought, well, it's not really a present, is it? If you, you know, <laughs> you're trying to bag it's a very honest, very honest from the heart one, though. It's <laughs> yeah, it starting totally. to turn out that way. But then I thought, what do we have in common? You know, and I and I just thought about all these sort of great musical memories, and the whole song just ends up becoming about 
essentially we don't have heaps in common and we don't always get on, but we do have, we both can agree that, you know, music is something that we both bond over. And if we don't, sure. if we can't communicate in any other way, at least we still have this. And it was funny how that process for me helped me move through a bit of forgiveness to, toward mm. him as well, which I, I didn't think I would likely do. I didn't feel like I could kind of, I was, I was always a little bit sort of angry and like, wow, yeah, it's pretty, so it's pretty hard. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. definitely hard too. When you, be, when I think when you see it through a lens of being a parent as well, Yep. And you realize what that takes and, and you know, the, the lack of responsibility there that, that, that was on their part, yeah. um, you know, that can really kind of rattle you a bit and, uh, you know, be quite well, frustrating. Was, all you, you know? can say is it's a different time, I guess, just communication. Well, wasn't yeah, I mean, I think there was a lot of collateral baggage coming out of the, the late 60s and 70s with the, you know, the, the sex, drugs, rock and roll and free love and all that. And it, and it really, you know the perception and you know the, the kind of like um the aspiring uh, archetype that many musicians wanted to be yeah um yeah it definitely left a lot of you know tragic young girls and boys you know with, without parents without a family together you know which was pretty much the only thing i wanted really yep. when i think about it when i was young was you know mum and dad to be together you know yeah and that just that just wasn't wasn't there. So, and I I think um, it's funny because a lot of the musicians I I know, like yourself and 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 um, and all the other musicians I know who are, who are parents, the the relationships are really solid. You know, with with their partners and and um, and that's that's really good to see. Yeah, it is. I mean, I I have had a I've had a few months off. I've had nine months off the booze now, and I realise that for a lot of the time on the road, I was not certainly not the best version of myself either. You know, I kind of got caught up in the myth a little bit when I was younger. That's but easy yeah. to do. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's where you can bring in a little bit of that and you do that, that kind of forgiveness thing because yeah. you know, you are young and you're testing the boundaries and you, you know, you're doing a bit of this and a bit of that and, you know, <laughs> and making choices here and there and then you're regretting this and that. And so, you know, you, it's, it's not always just pointing a finger. I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, yeah you, you, you're young, you know, you, you, you're doing some of those, but it's not to say that it's, it's, it's kind of right either. I mean, I think if I think back to it with what I know now in hindsight, I wish I didn't do a lot of the things I did, you know, oh, especially a much when it comes to line health. There that we didn't take. <laughs> What's that? There's a much straighter line that we did not take, you know, I feel mm. like I was just like, just took the long way around. Yeah, I'm pretty. Time. I'm pretty. I'm pretty glad that I actually did shut down the whole drinking thing, though. When I was 25, I, I'd, I'd made a really conscious decision decision to stop taking drugs and alcohol. Yeah. When I was about 25, 26, I, I saw you know patterns and and you know what that was going on with with other musicians and peer groups that are around, and yeah, and I really just I, I, I clamped down on it and just really found some discipline to. Yeah. really get you know my music right and and my head right and focus and and really uh, not be distracted you know and and that was a really good way of it, which was threatening to other people around me too because they were kind of like what are you seventh day adventists now like what's going <laughs> on <You know? laughs> it was like no i just you know it was a threat funnily enough that was what was really weird to people around me it became quite a threat because you weren't you know, and you could stay out all night. You could still, you know, have fun and yep. be out till two, three in the morning. You just weren't doing anything, you know. Yeah. I mean, you'd go when it got really, really silly because uh, <laughs> there was nothing in common. There was no real connection. Yep. Everyone was getting a bit sloppy. But, yeah, um, right. yeah it was, I think it was a good decision to, to have done yeah. that when I was, yeah, when I was 25. I'm not sure that it brings much. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time contemplating it and I don't, don't think it brings a lot. I think it takes some stuff away. I, I never got to like... I've always felt like my drinking, I sort of stayed. I didn't go too far down, but I did prevent me from going up as far as I, as I wanted. I think, you know, it was just kept very much just in the middle all the time. Mm. And, and now as, a, as, as you get older and you start to feel the passage of time a bit more and you go, I oh, just, there's just less time to waste. I think, you know, this thing's time is going to run so. out real quick and, you know, you're going to regret a lot of things that you didn't do. And, you know, I've got a lot of creativity left in me that I still want to get out. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Me too. Me too. Yeah. So you mentioned um, Vinnie Colaiuta 
and Billy Cobham earlier. Um, did you spend a lot of time in the so-called woodshed? Did you spend a lot of time doing a lot of your rudiments and theory and reading and that sort of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. In terms of you know, just getting in the room and practicing five, six hours yeah. a day um, was a big part of, there was a time between 13 and, and actually was, I guess it was kind of through that willing and able period, kind yeah. of leaving school in that, you know, that period there where I would, um, I would go and my father had a, um, he had a garage at the back of his house. So I was allowed to go out there and, and, and yeah. kind of play and practice. Um, so I would just go in there for hours and just, you know, just chop away and play and, and listen to records and, and do whatever I could to try and get better. You know, take, I'd take myself on a recorder. I'd take yep. that home. I'd, I'd go to sleep and listen to myself playing and seeing where I wasn't quite right or where awesome. I could fix things and, and where I was, you know, maybe do, things were going well. I could yep. develop them a bit more. So I wasn't reading at all. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I really wish that was something that I knew how to do. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of that was probably to do, do with two things. One would, would, would be like um, just patience. You know, I think I was a, yeah. a, 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 you know, a child that wouldn't really ne you know necessarily have the patience to sit there and try because I felt like I could already play the parts. This was yeah. the thing. So having to try to break it down and, and, and reestablish it, you know, it yeah. was like, you know, am I wasting time here? Should I just be, you know what I mean? So, yeah. but I, it's, it's something that I wish I could have I could do and I could still do it if I wanted to or if I really got into it but um it never held me back put it that way I, I was never whether I'd go into a session or I'd go and uh, you know play for other people or other projects or whatever I was usually pretty good with my memory um because yeah. I think there was that element of listening to so many records and listening to so yeah. many song structures that there became quite a predictable way of you know especially more you know popular rock music or whatever or contemporary music um you know the templates and the for the formulas were pretty similar so yep. you know you'd know you'd be going to a chorus or a verse or whatever like that um and if a producer would tell me to play this way or that way i, I could adapt quite quickly yeah um, so the memory was kind of good the mem the muscle memory was pretty good so i relied yep. on that a lot more than say reading um yeah but then I would be, yeah, definitely learning all my all my chops, all my rudiments as much as I could, then applying yeah. those into whatever style of music I was trying to play along to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that was a big part of my learning was, you know, really getting into, if it was funk, it was funk. You know, I'd play that for a week, nothing but funk <laughs> records. If it was jazz, I'd just play jazz, nothing but jazz records. Yeah. If it was Latin, I'd just play Latin, nothing but, you know, and you know whatever you know it was reggae punk whatever i would just really yep. compartmentalize all the different styles play along to them um, really try to understand them you know emulate the emulate the drummers in some respect in terms of the way their kits were set up as well to try and get the feeling of 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 what it was like to play that style of music or how they were approaching it um so yeah, you know, I could be playing to Steely Dan records or Van Halen records or Devo records or you know, uh, yep. Buddy Rich records. You know, you name it, Miles Davis. It it, it didn't really matter. You know, the Bob Marley. The, the the spectrum was really wide, and I think that yeah, was right uh, you know just really important for growth. That's awesome. Mm. Now I notice. So sort of on the flip side of that, or in, in addition to that, I noticed that you take in, in the cog set, you often take a, a solo. Um, but, and I noticed this with the, with the old John Butler trio drummer, the Kiwi guy, I don't, I can't remember what his name was. Um, Terrapai? You, was it Terrapai? Or maybe it was, it yeah, Terrapai. maybe the guy before, I always forget oh, okay. he, he changes, yeah. changes out that, he changes out the band a little bit, I think, from from record to record. But anyway, beside the point, I noticed that when you take your solos with, with with the cog stuff, you don't you don't seem to ever chop out for chop's sake, though. Like there's definitely you you, you almost do what I would think of as being almost like a, a beat based sort of drum solo. You kind of you're starting off with a rhythm and that sort of stuff, and I, and I think that that compared to some other, I don't know, I remember the Ozzy Osbourne the, the the drum solo that's on that live tribute album is just, you know, it's just ridiculous. Even Alex Van Halen's drum solo is just sort of ridiculous. It's kind of just seeing how fast you can do the, do the rolls and that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, is there, 
there's obviously a conscious choice that you, you that you're making there is but where do you where do you get the uh i don't know the the knowledge or the confidence to not just then show off all the work that you've put in you know yeah, why do you choose to go that way yeah it's funny you should you should see it that way too because it's um especially in cog we've we've never never really looked at individual uh, members like doing a solo as part of the show um mm. I think there's times where individual players might shine a little bit with a little section of what they might yep. be doing. Um, I've never regarded what you're talking about as kind of like a solo. Like when I go and play with other people, cover gigs or, or you know, other, other things that I've done, it's like everyone takes a good 10 minutes of a solo yep. and it's kind of like, you know, so it's a completely different environment than say like a cog show where that's more based on just the songwriting and the, the yep. collective, uh, you know, three members of the band playing and not necessarily about, you know, okay, well the spotlight's on you now. So, you know, yep. let's see what you can do. Um, but in other, other things that I've done, which is always good fun to do too, because you, you know, I, I like doing it in a way where, um, you know, with Cog, it's obviously a bit more, like you said, grounded. It's a, it's around a beat. It's not too flashy. It's just you're just hearing drums essentially. Yeah. So, you know, you you could go over the top a bit, but I, I do keep it quite reserved. And I think within the yeah. band, we've always thought it was a bit cheesy, in some <laughs> regard. So, <laughs> you know, and and uh, we, we we haven't wanted to go down that path, but. Um, yeah, okay. But with, with playing with other musicians, other projects and, and things like that, there have been times where it's like, okay, well, let's see what you can do. And that, and that can be quite intimidating. But I think I, I grew up um, obviously practicing a lot of things. And yep. when you get in that environment and you've got a time to, for lack of a better term, shine, if you will, you know, to, to show, yep. show off, lack of a better term, um, you know, the ability to actually just kind of go, okay, well, the, these tools that I've got, well, how can I put them together and how can they sound you know um sound good for for the listener and you know not be i mean you you want to entertain i mean that's what we're doing we're on a stage there's a there's there's there's, some of that is entertainment obviously but you you want to do it an integral way to you know of what you what you know and 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 you want to try and make it make sense and you want to um you know, you want to show w- what you can do in a sense of an ability, um, which yep. is not coming from a place of, um, well, it's, it's, it's just coming from, I always equate it to, to getting quite high or, or quite, quite meditative in some, re- in some regards, because you really block everything out and you, you, you know, you really um, go quite inner and, and it's mm. just you and, and people are just hearing you and you're just hearing you and every moment at, at that moment, it's not obviously, you know, in a room, it's not edited, it's not recorded, it's it's yep. just real life, it's real life playing. So you're on the spot. So it's a very spontaneous, um, creative uh, environment. And, and, and I think there's a, there's a real, um, uh, I, I get really seduced by that in some regards mm-hmm. because I can really find out who I am as a player, you know, and, and what I need to work on as well. Yeah. Um, and the drums are quite cathartic too, you know, because it's, it's it's very obviously mm. heavy hitting in some regards, and the dynamics are so huge, you know. So you you can really work with those. Um, so there's times where I really PA enjoy. Again. What's that? You're on that big PA again, like on that like big PA. Yeah. So there's, there's there's yeah there's times where I really enjoy it, and 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 I'll really try to own it, and and I in a sense that you know I, I every move that I'm making has to mean something or, you know, yeah. it's got integrity to it, you know, and then that's coming from a place of everything that I've learned in the past through, yeah. you know, as you said before, in the shed, kind of wood shedding and, and practicing and, and things like that. And, um, yeah, it's, you know, and, and, and if it's done right, I, th- I think, you mm-hmm. know, I love seeing a good sax solo or guitar solo or bass solo or yep. someone really, you know, just, show what they can do on the piano or, or something like that it's it can be really really enjoyable um but in cog it's just always been something quite quite different you know a, a little yeah a little different the way we it's shape more the just the odor of a song isn't it you normally just sort of do it as kind of the outro of one of the tracks normally yeah it? yeah it's it's, it's, kind of it's, it's a bit it's a bit like that you know and depending on the way i'm feeling I, i'm you know it, it might be quite reserved or other times it might be quite 
you know, it's like, oh, okay, he's, he's going to go for an extra minute. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah, <laughs> something like something like that. You know, it's un un unfettered like communication from from your heart straight to the audience. I think you know, mm. and, and if you're not feeling it, some nights just like you know, I'm down. It's all good. Let's just. I, th- I think also, yeah, I think there's a there's, with the cog music too. There's a there's a it's a it's very drumming orientated already. So, you know, it's very choppy already you know i'm doing a lot within a lot of the songs it's definitely not just straight ahead you know meat and potatoes for lack of a better term you know kind of straight down the line music you know there's there's it's been created in a way where it is quite creative uh with 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 different types of rhythms and and chops and things like that you know it's just applying those to songs you know really yeah how do you handle that makes sense odd time stuff oh it went a bit funny um so is, I think I asked you one time because I was always confused about how you count the end of the, the or the into the middle of real life, for example. And I was like, da, 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 oh, yeah. I, I, to this day, still don't know how to count. Yeah, it's a weird one because it throws you back on the, on the offbeat, which is on the outbeat. Yeah. Yeah, which which is which is, is quite strange. Where does that come from? Is that like is it do you all kind of dabble in the sort of that prog side of things, or is that something that you're driving because of the influences you have, or and and when and when you're writing that as well, is it kind of like are you running it over? If say if you're coming up with the idea, are you run? Do you have to run it over and over and over again for everyone else to pick it up, or is everyone pretty quick off the mark? With, yeah, with the, the interesting thing. thing about the the, the players in, in the band is um, that everyone feels things quite differently, and we're definitely not players that you know go well. This is in five four, or this is in seven eight, or ten fourteen, yeah. or whatever it is. You know, there's there's never been um, there's never been that kind of that that comes later. It's like, well, what is that? And then we try yeah. to work it out. But for some reason, um, we've got the ability to to feel music other than four four in different ways of phrasing and and you know uh, and that type of thing which is interesting i mean i spent a lot of years listening to like um very prog orientated fusion based rock music out of the 70s you know um so really mahavishnu orchestra and and those you know weather report and all those type of bands so they were they were really you know pushing those boundaries and i guess i would be playing along to that stuff not not even necessarily counting it by any means but um you know just starting to understand the the, the kind yep. of rhythmical change or, or when that rhythmical change happens where it loops yeah um and it was never really about well what's the time signature yeah but it was about understanding it through a different mean of just listening and feeling it so i think within yep. cogs music there's that ability to to do that and then we, we we will kind of reference and go well that's in that timing but there's other you know times where We'll come up with a rhythm or a, a guitar part or or whatever, and you'll start playing it. But one of us will pick it up on a different beat, so it's yeah. kind of like, well, I was actually feeling it on that beat. That's the one there, instead yep. of you know where. And I'm going, well, no, this is actually where the one is. That's how. It, so then you'll have that conversation and try to work that out. Um, so there is there's an ability there, which is really yep. why Cog is like it is. I guess it's 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 kind of had that. Um, ability to, to to be proggy in in that that sense with just the timings but it's not yep. it's definitely not learnt in a sense of like you know writing it down and studying it and all that stuff yep. it's definitely a, just a feel um a feel thing i think it's funny sometimes i'll um like something like what if or whatever i'll be listening to it and i and i'm not i, I don't i'm not great at feeling on times i can work it out and i've played odd times and when, when necessary, but it's not something that comes naturally, but then I'll sort of like be awkwardly singing along or whatever. And um, but then I notice someone like Sash who doesn't play music can actually sing along with that sort of stuff way better because she's not, she's disengaged. Like, where is that one? Mm. You know, mm. she's just like, she just feels it a lot more. And I'm kind of a bit envious of that. Like wish I could kind of disconnect a little bit. And I think that sometimes it happens like when you when you write, certainly when we write something that might have a bit of an odd time in it, it's really just a case of 
there's that process of writing in the room where it, it builds slowly from such a like a simple idea that it kind of gets in at the ground level and you don't even have to almost think about it after a while because you kind of sure it just yeah. just sort of flows the way it flows and it couldn't be any other way you know yeah I mean, exactly yeah I feel, we feel it like that too definitely do you have a different process if you're the one bringing the idea versus having the idea brought in do you i mean do, do you generate some initial ideas say well, let's talk about cog but you can reference you know any of the other bands that you, yeah, sure. you write for as well and yeah, like well, I've, it, I've always i've always played guitar as well see that's yeah. the, that's that i got a guitar when i was like 12 yep learned three chords and i think the the moral of the story with that in some regards was you know if you write songs, you might even be able to make a little bit more money <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> instead of just being the drummer. So, yep. and not that that was the intention at all, but I, I, I remember that being said. And, um, and I remember thinking to myself, um, when I wasn't playing drums or practicing, I still wanted to do something musical. Yeah. So, you know, you'd do five or six hours in the, you know, playing drums and then you'd kick back on the couch and you'd play guitar for an hour and I, you, you kind of be just learning how to play and shape the chords and, and do whatever. So um, I've always been interested in playing guitar and, and not lead, but and I've never learnt, uh, you know, chords in the sense of how they're put together and what's what's meant to go next and in the chord structure and sequence and, and that it's yeah. all been listening and it's all been about just shaping my fingers to where it sounds good and 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 cog we're, we're an open tuned band so a lot of the strings that um you know the higher strings are always can be tuned differently yeah um there's a there's that drop kind of you know d thing or c thing going on as well so we use that that type of a uh, um you know root note um which you know yep. gives it that thicker sound you guys do that too in, in butterfly yep. effect it's kind of become kind of pretty much commonplace now Yep. Um, but yeah, if I write something, a riff or a guitar riff, I'll just bring it to the, to the band. And, um, if, if the guys like it and, and it, um, it's creating a vibe and it's giving a feeling, then it'll pass. Um, sometimes you got to try and, you know, sell it a bit more yep. than other times. Um, but I mean, you, you know, this, I'm always every day I'll always pick up the guitar pretty much and, and I'll yep. always try to put something on the, the, the little uh, iPhone, you know, yep. the little voice memo iPhone thing. So, and at least get something down. You never know. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if, if I've got half a song, sometimes I've got a full song, sometimes I've just got one riff um, and that can be the same with any, any one of us really yep. um, in the band, you know, and it's quite, it's 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 quite interesting in that regard because everyone's coming from different angles um you know flynn might write a drum part that i would have never thought of you know uh, or same with luke or i might write a bass part or the flynn might write the bass part or it's a or the vocals or the lyrics or you know um yep. everyone gets a everyone gets a kind of um a go with 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 some of the lyrical content or the melody you know so it's it's a really uh, interesting way of writing because obviously in some projects, some bands, you do bass, you do drums. I'm the vocalist. I write, so it's very compartmentalized yeah. in that way. But we're we're very interwoven in in many regards. But you know we we are really trying to find that um that just that feeling, that unique feeling that the three of us will go. Well, there's the feeling united, and that's mm. the one we're going to run with, meaning the riff or the you know whatever it's yeah. going to be. And that's the one that usually makes it onto the onto the records. I've wondered, do you have like a? Is there like some kind of stonking riff that you've that you've got on the on file somewhere that you like periodically bring back to the band and go, "Hey guys, have you? Yeah, we haven't used this riff before." And they're like, oh, "We didn't like it before." You know, do you have like sort of like some stuff that you sort of repeatedly bring back that you that you kind of you're super sold on that. You just oh, absolutely! Find a yeah, way to yeah. Try you've tried to you've <laughs> tried to kind of sculpt it in a different way, or put other chords with it, or yep. or whatever, and bring it, you know, and 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 kind of dynamically use it in a different way. You know, you might it might have been yep. distorted before, but now it's clean. You yeah, know, cool. Um, 
So yeah, definitely, definitely done that. I mean, I mean, I'm always just trying to, if, if there's a riff or something that doesn't, um, I guess the three of us aren't really agreeing on, yep. I will just keep developing it in its own way and putting it in the, you know, the kind of file over here, which is music that I just keep creating and having fun yep. with, you yep. know, so hopefully one day I'll have, you know, enough bits and pieces to have my own album, you know what I mean? Yep. And, and, and just for creative sake, you know, just, just have it um have it there and and do what i can with it put it out and and yeah. all that type of stuff because i've got the i've got the studio i've got the technology and all that type of yeah. stuff and i know how to record things so i've got those tools to be able to you know bring that to life um a good riff is a good riff obviously we all hear things differently and they can mean different things to to, to different people at different times yeah. um you know I, I think one of the the dangers that we have is, is obviously liking a riff or getting involved with a riff um, and really liking it. But then all, all of a sudden, yeah. two weeks, three weeks later, you're kind of going, oh, is it really, is it really that good? Because you've obviously been playing it. You've, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, 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 is it, is it boring to me now? But I think what's, what you've got to remember is when you first started playing it, which is what a listener would do is when they first listen to it, it's, it's, it's like, wow, okay, that's, that's kind of cool. Let's, you know, let's run with that. That's, that's great. Let's, so if you can, if you can keep that in the back of your mind and, and, and instead of going, oh, kind of over it now, it's kind of boring. It's not, but when you (laughs) first originally had it, it was like, wow, is this going to be great? You know? Maybe hang on to a little bit of that. Sometimes that can work. Some, you yep. know, a, a good riff's a good riff, and it, it should be kind of, obviously, timeless and ageless. You know. So there, there's definitely riffs sitting in the, I guess, in the vault that are, you yeah. know, that will be brought up. It's like let's try this one. We've had that. We've had a couple of times where there's been songs that have, um, that I think have been good songs, but they've been written and recorded before one member of the band could catch up that they didn't like the song and certainly they've been two of the more popular songs with the fan base. And then you Phoenix and in these hands come to mind immediately. And, you know, so it's like, you've almost got to be careful that you don't, well, there's two, there's a couple of things. You've got to be careful that you don't write something you're not proud of because it might be the thing that the fans run with, but you've also, I think that, say with the people in the band that don't like the, that didn't like those two tracks, there's a reason why they liked them to be, to begin with. And then that's almost like they're going, they've gone for their emotional, their emotions kick in at the start and their emotions go, this is a great tune. And that takes them past, that takes them a month into the process to when the song's recorded or or demoed or, or even properly recorded. And then the head kicks in and then the overthinking happens and then suddenly they're going back and going, oh, hang on a sec, maybe, maybe this isn't cool. Maybe this is, oh shit, this has got a, this has got a Disney modulation at the end. Oh God, what have we done? You know. And I, but I think that maybe the heart sometimes is the more accurate uh, appraisal, you know, or measure of the song. Maybe you just overthought it a little bit too much and started to worry what other people think. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree with some of that for sure. And I think that um, I get enjoyment out of seeing my band members um, enjoy something that they like. Maybe I don't really like it that much. Maybe I'm not really into it too much, but I enjoy that they enjoy it. So yeah. in terms of supporting them, um, you know, that that's that's a good thing, you know. Yeah. And, and it's if it's like 100% your way all the time, um yeah, you know, I mean, that would be great if all three of you, a hundred percent, could be yep. in on it to, you know, to the nth degree. But um, sometimes that doesn't happen. But I, if it, if it gets that that kind of situation with with any project that I'm with or whatever, I just enjoy the fact that they're enjoying it. So I like the the element of supporting that. Yeah. Um, and 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 it, that that hardly happens really because I think we're, you know, we're always striving for the three of us, especially in Cog, to to kind of yep. um, or or in any project that I, I work with really to be happy with what we've got yeah. um, but you know as an artist and anyone will tell you any other artist or creative um, person will tell you that there, there are times where you 
you're your own worst enemy and you know <laughs> sometimes you've got to get out of the way and you've got to take a break and then you come back and you go well, what was i worried about you know or, <laughs> it was actually it's actually all right but um really yeah you, you definitely can't worry about what other people think i think that's when no. i heard you say that yeah i think that's a big part of you know really trying to write something that actually can be quite um quite unique you know if you're always worrying about what other people think well then you're yeah you're probably going for things that have already been done because they're proven formulas, you know, that, yeah. that, that, you know, and then you'll end up sounding like something, you know? So if you go into that space where you're vulnerable and you go, well, I, I really like it. I don't really know how anyone else is going to take it. It doesn't yeah. really sound like anything, but that's that, you know, that risk. Um, maybe that's, that's the best place to be. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I like the dynamic that we have is I, I'm, you've mentioned it a couple of times and I think, from coming from like a more theoretical place or more from a sort of a straight pop place, I try and take things in a stock way, like push things in a stock direction too much. I'm very happy to doing like a, a one, four, five, minus six, you know, kind of, kind of progression and playing with someone like Kurt, who's completely by feel, we kind of balance each other out. I'm always trying to say, Hey, maybe we should go more towards this typical thing. And he's like, nah, that's really boring. But then he might do something that's completely out there. And so we kind of act as these count, this, this counterbalance. But I, I do think I wish sometimes I could like just disconnect the, the overthinking of in the process. And I guess that's one good thing about being in a band with Kurt, who is also a strong personality, is that if you try and overthink things, he won't let you overthink things. He's just like, no, no, no it's, it's going to go this way. And you're like, okay, cool. Well, this is a lesson that I have to learn too. You know, I have to learn to be able to go, all right, I'm not going to, mm. I, I think this chorus would be great if it sounded like, I don't know, Bruce Springsteen or something, but you don't want to go there. And so there, I can't force you to be, to yeah. be where I am, you know? So, and you, and you sort yeah, of grow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's that kind of, well, I, I look at it as like you're trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, there's no point having kind of that attitude in some regards. I think if you are overthinking it, you know, you lose the initial vibe of it. Yeah, um, in a lot of ways and cog can be you know quite critical absolutely critical sometimes overly critical you know to the point where it's, it's it becomes quite arduously boring <laughs> um you know and, and it's like to try and get i mean the results end up good and sometimes you go through that process and, and it's worth it but yeah it, it's kind of like it's like taking it, you know, there's a fine line between taking it seriously and, and then just like trying to reinvent the wheel or something, you know, it's, it's yep. like a, it's like a fine, a fine line there. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, I won't keep you much longer cause it's oh, you're right. going for an hour or so, but I can see your uh, studio looks lovely up there. You've doing yeah. a fair bit of production work and stuff these days studio 101 bar in there yeah yeah it's been it's been great i mean i got into production and and you know music production i always wanted to you know run and record um run a studio and record bands and be part of projects and produce and yep. and, and things like that um i've always found that side awesome um i love mixing i, I love trying to capture sounds and all that type of stuff and it's been probably six seven years now of you know finally getting it to this well where i've got a space where i can record properly and got the gear and and all the all the bells and whistles so um yeah i've been i've been doing i just had cram from spider bait in here the other day he's, he's right. he was doing some stuff and he's coming back in to do some other stuff and then i had um a band from brisbane called uh, rhino and some a band out of newcastle and amata uh, the devil's desert sea from sydney um, Andrew from Wolf Mother came in and, and did some tracks. I played on a track, done, you know, so it's yeah. the, the studios, you know, over time, the last couple of years is slowly, but surely getting a bit more word of mouth and, you know, it's, it's a home studio, but it's, it's a great, yep. comfortable environment, you know, in that regard. So yeah, and I just, I just, I just, I just base tracking at your, uh, at your home, home studio in Maruba, I believe back in, I don't know. Yeah, we that, that's, project, that's the, the knowing. Yeah, project. that was in between <laughs> studios when I had to pack up my first studio, That's right. which was I kind of was Key Sound Studios in Sydney, which I had running for like you know three years, which was great. And then uh, nice. they changed the the rental property thing, so I had to move out of there. And then she kind of shut down, couldn't find anywhere, so I was kind of back at home. And then couldn't. Yep. It was just too hard to you know 
be renting a place and then also pay for a space for for a recording studio at my yep. level anyway. So uh, when this came up, um, it was just such a great opportunity. So yeah, um, it's it's you know we've got a great little recording room in there and tracking room, and then the you know this is the the mixing room and all the rest of it. So. Yeah, is, it's, is it it's attached a to your comfy, house? Comfy space. Or do you have yeah, travel? basically, yeah. So yeah. that's the other good thing. It's a, it's an it's an all in one, which is fantastic. So dream, mate, it's um, the dream. Yeah, pretty pretty much, pretty pretty much. <laughs> you know, yeah, re- really happy with that. I mean, that was something I definitely wanted to manifest. Um, you know, when I was very young, you know, I wanted yeah. to have the. Always thought that would be a really good, great thing to have. You know, down the track would to be to have a recording studio where you could set up your drums, you could mic your drums, you could. You know, you could record your drums and you could just be an artist and, and like a painter with the paints and the canvas and, you know, you have a room where you do it. So, um, totally. And with you playing guitar and bass and drums and with all your little your stockpile of riffs, you know, you could, uh, we could see a solo record sooner yeah, rather than Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to put something out, you know. Yeah. I, I really would. I, I'm, I've always, you know, I, I feel I've got the ability to, to, to craft something, you know, yeah, that, sure. that, that's kind of like how I feel um, about music and, and, yep. and what I think feels and sounds good and what's yep. coming directly from me um, in a sense. Um, yeah, the, the vocals is another story. I've always can't, you know, kind of felt that I was more of a – and the backings is, is kind of where it's at yep. for me, but not being a lead singer or, or not – I wish I could. I wish – you know, there's some people that can sing, you know, the cow jumped over the moon and it just sounds amazing, you know, and there's <laughs> yeah. other people that try and it just doesn't – but then there's other people that sing and they're not really singers but they've got an attitude or they've got some kind of yeah. style or something that kind of, you know, just works as a – so um, I did a, an experiment the other day which was interesting because I've done a um, – I've been – putting together this um, cover of Blue Monday um, yep. from New, New Order. So I've done all the, all, the, all the instrumentation on that and and I've I sung on that. And mm. and I've been thinking, well, you know, should I sing of it? Should I? And I, anyway, I was talking to Cram um, about it and he goes, well, just play it to me. And I was like, oh, I haven't played it to him. <laughs> yeah. So I played it to him and, um, and it was great to get, some reflection back from him because he's pretty honest and, and, and you know, he's not going to, it's not going to fluff things around. So he gave me some really good pointers, but the good thing was he didn't say, um, well, I don't, I don't think you should do lead singing or you should have yeah. a lead vocal there. You know, you should get someone else to do it. I think he, um, he, he, he kind of, you know, he, it passed, you know, but yep. he said, gave me some pointers, which was great to, to work with. So, I mean, for me, you know, just, just being creative is, is, is a very important part of my nature. Yeah. Um, whether it makes it on, you know, out into the world or not. So, um, for, for me, that, that part of my, you know, reality is, is, is just so, um, just so sacred to my nature, you know, it's, yeah. it's in alignment with, with creation, you know, in a sense, you know, that you are yeah. creating, you, you are p- pursuing imagination, you know, yeah. um, and, and, and ideas, you know, cause ideas are very, uh, are, um, they they've got a lot of value in terms of, um, you know, living, living life, you know, sure. and experiencing life, you know, and if you can pass them on, if they come through with sound and people enjoy them, I mean, that's, that's awesome. Well, I think it's, it's, it's such a mystical process, even for me to this, even to this day that you can start the day with nothing and end the day with something that didn't exist in the world before it, it's, it has form and structure and it. It was a, it was a, an idea that, didn't have substance it's a bizarre thing yeah where it comes out of you especially through the instrument you know i mean this whole living life is an absolute trip you don't have to take anything it's a trip in itself you know it's like every day having to deal with the ultimate trip and then all of a sudden (laughs) you know like the music having these abilities to use these tools to create music in this sound and it's just i mean yeah it is such a it is such a, a a great gift you know, in, in so many regards, and I, I find that to be a musician and is is a very, um, you know, we're, we're very fortunate. You know, there's, there's yeah. I don't take it for granted. Put put it that way. You know, I think it's a it's a really great place to be in terms of like being able to either cocoon yourself and you yeah. know, uh, or or be quite outward and and also express yourself to others and and be very, um, um, you know, in, invoking. Um, 
joy and happiness mm. and, and, yeah. and a, good, a great experience. And I, I guess that a lot of that's what I got into it for too, was that, yeah. you know, that yeah. moment like we talked about on stage and there's just being able to, you know, hopefully over time, 40 odd years, the consistency of contributing to the, the, the musical community and, and also the yeah. community at large to, to, to make a better world or make a better place, yeah. you know, um, which is quite interesting now that we can't do that which is yeah. so part of our, um, you know, considering we're in these COVID-19 uh, phases and that we yeah. can't actually contribute to that vibration or that, that connection, which is so fundamentally important to our nature and our spirit, yeah. you know, and not to do it, um, especially in the live environment, um, is I, I think something um, we have to be very very wary of that, that 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 not getting back to that is going to be quite yeah. destructive for our nature and we we can do a lot of things online and and you know bits and pieces and that's all very cool and and but really um the you know the real uh, magic of it and and the that vibrational relationship we have together collectively in the same room mm. is is what's so is is worth a lot for for our experience, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I hope we get back to it sooner rather than later. That's for sure. Oh, for sure. I did a um, I had a I did a house party on on Saturday night that was, um, so it was obviously not under the same venue restrictions, and so people were dancing and and probably not being particularly COVID safe as it were. But the difference in say the gigs that I'd done previously when everyone had to be seated at you know, restaurant style sure. um, was just so night and day. And I, and, mm. and I think I'd forgotten about that energy, that the energy transfer that happens when you're in a room full of people and they're just vibing on you and you're vibing on them. And it's just, you know, it's backwards and forwards. And it's, it was just almost like, like he, he, taking a hit of a drug, you know, and you just go, oh, well, that's it, right. yeah, just, it helps get helps. This all the time. It helps lift the, the 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 intensity of the trip too, you know. In so many regards of daily life, you know, it, it really yeah. does, and and it's it's so important in, in yeah. that in that regard. And you know, when you, it's it's been there, f and you know, in our cultures and and in our nature for so long. You know, the drums and the vocal, especially being the first form of rhythm and and vocal and yeah. song, you know, to to create dance and tell stories and 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 you know, bring in imagination and ideas and yeah. Um, those things are, are very, very powerful because they, they can formulate um, ideas and, and, and revolutions, you know, oh, sure. in some regards, you know, yeah, in some yeah, instances. Exactly. So um, being shut down um, can stifle a lot of, a lot of that big time. Um, and I think, I think hopefully that um, we can all start really pushing if they can have – 60,000 people in a, in a football stadium watching football. I love watching football. I like playing football. I play futsal on Wednesday nights. I, I love sport. Um, yeah. But if they can have 50,000, 60,000 people in a sports stadium and other stadiums, why can't you have 500 people in a, in a venue? You know, like, yeah. so the, it's, it's not weighing up, you know, especially now after all this time. So I think whoever's out there listening to this musicians or whatever, we're going to start asking ourselves really solid questions here now that, um, yeah. you know, if we don't start really, you know, directing what we want in terms of how we want to live our lives and how we want to make our money and, and what's important to us in yeah. these, you know, um, relationships of music with people and community. Um, yeah, we, we, it's, it's something we've really got to kind of start pushing towards, yeah. I think, yeah. you know, yeah. start um, asking those questions, you know. Knocking on those current. doors, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, otherwise we'll be just trapped in this virtual space, you know, disconnected, but connected in a weird, different type yeah. of way. But not having that, you know, that kind of hands-on vibrational, you know, next to each other, dancing, feeling, experiencing yeah. uh, the real, true emotions of of what it's like to be in in real life. You know, yeah. Pardon the pun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's gonna. There's there's got to be a bit more of a clear roadmap. It's, it's sort of, it's very frustrating for all of us, mm. especially when, you know, who knows what's going to happen in March when the financial support runs out and the, and the home loans have to be repaid and yep. yeah, some, someone's going to have to make some decisions. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
And I think, you know, that's up to us. You know, we, yep. it, it, it really is. I mean, we and if we can collectively do it together and, and we, without a state of fear and start going, well, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Um, you know, the benchmark is, I mean, you know, you, 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 you're dealing with, a you know, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, obviously, you know, we've talked about a lot, but, you know, yeah. I think we kind of know what we're, where we're heading in terms of what, what we would like it to be and, and what we need to kind of hopefully pry open to, to get it basically, you know, back to some kind of normality to, um, it, you know. Do you reckon Muso's Union's the way to go? I've been seeing a bit of that online and, I mean, I sort of, you know, I guess in other industries, strong unions equal strong uh, strong negotiations. I mean, I just, or do you have any other... Is yeah, well, it's a start. I think, I think, I think, yeah, I think that's a start in that area that can, that can yeah. do some good. I think then, you know, musicians have to start having the conversation about it too, um, you know, and, and they need to start asking some serious questions about, you know, where's yeah. it going? What's it going to look like? You know, how's it going to, and, it, you know, things are, I've seen certain things that, you know, are opening up, so to speak, and, and, you yeah. know, but there is that disconnection, you know. There, obviously, there's a, as you termed it, the COVID safe type of a um, yep. situation or an environment that you have to you have to bring into account. But you know, it's not proportionate to what it costs to put on a show, or, or you know, no. it, it's like when is that going to, you know, you may be able to put a certain amount of people in a room, but um, you know, in terms of like budgeting and, and what it costs to put on a show yeah. is it worth it you know it doesn't make any sense you know you gotta yeah it doesn't well, make any sense to have any 500 bus. people you gotta have a, a room by this size and that size which is going to cost you that much more to hire which is you know it's just yeah you know it may sound great in terms of like well you can play but you've just got to do this but it doesn't actually uh seem to kind of re reflect the true mm. um you know logistics of it all we can't, I know we can't go on the road to half full rooms. I can't like sell the Metro out at 500 people or whatever, you know, and make sure everyone's a meter and a half, you can't, two meters. You can't do it. No. So, I mean, you know, like, cause we, as you, you guys would probably do, we, we don't do it all the time. So we have a fairly high expenditure to, you know, in, in out kind of ratio. So it's not, never a cheap thing. And if you start doing half full rooms, it's just not just, worth it. You know, going out so you know yeah, and that's unfortunately yeah it's it's you, you can't take that hit it's it's not going to cover no. the costs i mean i think people will start obviously doing i've been i was asked actually when this whole thing kicked off i was asked to uh, to join this um this faith no more um, cover band yeah, saw that. um called fnm so i've been rehearsing with that band every tuesday night and obviously i've come from growing up playing in cover bands and you know, when I got into my early 20s, I, I played in a, a rolling, uh, sorry, a um, Buddy Holly theatre show. So I was doing, you know, big production theatre cover band production of Buddy Holly, which is, you know, 50s music. Yeah. So I've always had, whether I'm playing in a Led Zeppelin thing or tribute to that or whatever, that's always been part of my playing. So, and, you know, working with other musicians and, and whatever else, good way to keep you playing up as well when your original band's not, not working keep yeah. chops up so to speak so yeah we've been doing that every kind of tuesday night and rehearsing but we did put on a, a show and it was you know it was an invite only kind of a situation and um yeah, everyone was re respectively you know res respectively um adhering to yeah. covid safe kind of guidelines so to speak but I guess what I'm saying is, is that, you know, putting on your own shows or starting to find spaces where you can put on your own shows if you actually can't, you know, you know yep. get into these venues. And I mean, that's what we're going to have to do um, if we want to keep playing music, if we want to keep being together in the same room and, and, and you know, having that experience, you know, there's, if, if, if it keeps getting pushed back and there's no kind of uh, end time, end date, um, yep. to, to, to this whole thing in terms of opening up, well, then people are just going to take things into their own hands. And I think they'll just, you'll start seeing more underground things and yeah. which in itself is kind of exciting to some degree. Cause I remember back in the day, Cog would do that as well. You know, it wasn't with all these things that we're going through now, but we would just find places, we'd find spaces, we'd fill it with a PA and we'd tell people through an invite, you know, and people would come down and fill the room and it would be like a party environment and, and you'd have a good time and, and, you know, you'd all rock out and have fun, you know, and 
there could be warehouse parties like that. I remember those type of things going down in abandoned, you know, buildings and things like that. So I think people will get into that, you know, they'll, they'll yeah. start doing that, especially if this just keeps pushing out longer and longer and longer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because people want I mean, that experience. It's a part of our nature and it's so ingrained in us to, to have that experience, to make us feel good. Yeah. Um, you know, to have that and, and keep on travel through our days with, with the music experience, you know, we're having a, I think there's a definitely a diminishment of, of goodwill in the community. Like the longer it goes on and the less clear the directions are like, this is like, we were happy to do these things or shut these things down or do these other things for a while. And you said, all we needed to do was this, this, and this, and then this, this, this would happen. Mm. But we did all those things and it still hasn't happened. Um, so what you know and, yeah. and i think again it's just that it's always that not knowing for me the times where i get most desperate is when is when i start to see you know my family be impacted by by these things and i know i've got it really good compared to a lot of people so i know there's a lot of people out there that are super stressed and mm. you just there's going to have to be a time where something changes yeah, a united front, a united front with musicians that make a stand and, and collectively, you know, have a voice with, with yeah. kind of like, well, this is, we're going to draw, we're going to have to draw a line in the sand here somewhere and we're going to have to say, um, these are our terms and conditions and these is, this is what we want to happen, you yeah. know. Um, and obviously there's, there's big players in the music industry that can help pry open some of those things and have the conversations yeah. with, with the certain, you know, different political factions and state governments and all the rest of it um but yeah it's 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 um you know it's definitely taking its its toll um that's for sure i almost think that sometimes some people who aren't artistic don't realize how much they actually do use art in their life you know putting on music when they get home or you know watching netflix or whatever and you, and you they, so there's sort of almost a disconnect from the fact that this art exists in a format to consume and that there's actual human beings somewhere along the process having to bring it into, you know, bring it to fruition. So like happy to have all of the things, happy to have all the art around them, but then, no, oh, no, no, no. These people are just, you know, that standard, uh, well, why don't you just get a real job? You know, like, but I guarantee you, you listen to the things that we make and the things that we film and, and, and the shows that we're in, you know, like it's, but I don't know why that disconnect happens. I guess maybe because it's like some people say, Oh, I can't hear the bass or I can't hear the guitar part when they listen to a track. Cause they're just not tuned into that frequency, I guess. And so they don't, that's why they're always disconnected. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were told there was a term that was given to us when this whole thing happened. It was non-essential. Yeah. So we were we were told right then you, you're not essential. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's that that should tell you a lot about how people, well, especially people in the in the authority kind of um, departments yep. of government, um, corporate government, um, think of of music and musicians. Yep. I mean, it's kind of like you've got an industry that pays an annual, you know, um, you know, taxation to into the into into the communities and into the australian way of life yep. through what we do which is huge you yeah know, it's, it's a huge amount of money and and it's um a contra you know it's what we have to do um which is based on what we do obviously and and, and that all of a sudden you know it's kind of like well how can you be non-essential if you are working you are paying taxes you are contributing but then you're considered to be non-essential mm. Uh, even even just given that term, yeah. you know, and it just doesn't go for music; it goes for other people too. Yeah. You know, time, you know, other other kind of things as well. So, it, it's you know, it's a bit of a slap in the face in, yeah. in so many regards. You know, um, because like you said, people use music as a soundtrack to their life. Yeah. You know, and and they, they, yeah, they're, they're they're involved in it whether they like it or not. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's it's always there in some form or of another. You know, and and may, maybe that's you know part of musicians um musicians kind of mistakes as well as is not giving it more value than it than it should have you know yeah. maybe we've just kind of been t a bit too slap happy um and hence the reason why the value of music's gone if we're talking monetary it's it's you know it's really 
it's been devalued in so many ways, you know. Yeah, totally. Across the board. So I think we're I, you know, I'm less I feel less inclined to want to fight for it on some levels because I enjoy playing it so much. And sometimes I feel like and maybe it's a problem with me, but maybe I feel like sometimes maybe they're right because it's almost like growing up you're told that you have to and don't want to open another whole can of worms but you're almost told sort of like you'll you'll have a job and that job will be something that you'll be unhappy with and and you'll go to it every day but then you'll get rewarded by being paid cash and you get to go out and drink booze on the weekends but then monday morning you rock back up and you do this thing and you you rush to retirement so then when you can finally just sit around and and you know garden and drink booze in your spare time you know and um we decided that we didn't want to go for the job that we that we hated. We wanted to spend time doing the things that we loved. And then when someone says, well, isn't, you know, it's just a hobby. And I'm like, well, yeah, on some level, I guess it's my hobby as well, but it's only because I love my job so much. My job is my hobby because I, when I'm not at work, I do the thing that I do for work. So, you know, and I think everyone would be a bit happier if that was more the case. <laughs> Generally. Well, it is work, you know, working as a musician and what we do and, and, and what goes into it is, is yeah. an enormous amount of work, yeah, totally. creative work, energetic work. It's, it's work. And, um, you know, it just so happens that it's, it's, it's come out of the, the, you know, it's come out, it comes out of the imagination and, and, and all that type of stuff it gets quantified and obviously there's, you know, we want to keep doing it. So yeah. it becomes valuable. People want it more, obviously. So then it, you, you become kind of like consistently employed to, you know, produce more and, and to play. And so it becomes its own real job, yeah. you know, it, and, and at the end of the day, you're also paying taxes. So it, it is, it is a, you know, an in place of, of employment and yeah. integrity employment across the board. Okay. It's, you know, it's not, it's not just a hobby. It, you know, I think people with real jobs, they'll, they might have, um, or if you want to call them real jobs, but you know, they might have, they might play music on the weekends or something like that. But you know, five or six days a week, they're actually working in something else they might like, or maybe something they don't like, but you know, musicians, um, especially given if you start at a young age and that's what you, you do and you strive for. Yep. Um, and that's why I don't, it's funny with the term band, you know, and, and saying that the, when people ask you, well, what do you do? You know, um, the last thing I want to say is I play in a band because it always sounds like, you know, it's not, it's, yeah, it's non-essential you know, or it's not serious. Yeah. So I get, I, but when you say you're a musician, um, that can somehow, you know, tweak it in a different way, you yeah. know, and, 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 uh, I say, I think as soon as you, you, uh, people start paying to come through the door to see see you play it's a business you know and it's got to be treated as any other business and it should be respected as any other business i think um i i thought this before when you're talking about all the different things you're involved in and i think this is just sort of tapping into that idea of music as a business um it's very admirable how you can wear so many hats across the board and whether that be not only just as as a producer or as a a writer of riffs and things, but also how you can transition from happily being a side person in a cover band to being the lead person in an originals project. And especially, you know, like uh, an originals project that's very, that has a lot of, you know, a lot of acclaim of, of different sorts. Um, and I think that that's, I guess what you would call it like the, the modern day Renaissance man kind of, kind of thing you know you you kind of do you find that something that's necessary to be able to keep a career as a musician to better transition between all these different different wear all these different hats well the most important thing is is doing something you that you want to do in this life yeah i think that's fundamental i think if you're if you're doing something in this life that you don't like doing um that's a shame yeah you know um, i think that's a real shame and but if you can find something that you really love doing and you really like doing, um, you should stay with it and you should stick with it. And, and yep. if you can make something out of it and it becomes valuable in, in whatever sense, um, well, then that's great. Then that's that's really good. I mean, I've got no other skill really in anything else. I mean, I've put all my time and energy and thought and imagination and, and 
creativity into music. Um, and it doesn't matter whether I'm playing in a cover band or an original yep. thing or, or whatever. The, if it's all under the umbrella of being musical and, and you know, having musical relationships and experiencing music in different formats and yep. in different ways um, to, to grow and to, and to, you know, to keep that spirit alive. You know, I yep. consider myself a spirited being, you know, like and, and the spirit um, being healthy requires yeah. it to have that relationship with music yeah um so it doesn't matter what what form you know it doesn't really matter what form and i enjoy all the different um you know angles of it you know and it's interesting too you're not going to the same office you're not looking at the same computer you're not in the same environment i mean you're always in different that's what's really healthy about it too you know you, you're consistently having different experiences with different people, with different yep. musicians, different locations, different sound sources, different instruments, um, and that's that's very valuable to the spirit and the health of of, mm. of, of your own um, being. And and, oh, it. and 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 it compl completes you in a sense that it makes you happy. You yeah, know? and and that's a good thing. We want to be happy. <laughs> yeah. you know, there's a lot of us we're, we're trying to find that space. Um, <laughs> you know, whether whether it, it hits a mark or it. Or it doesn't. I mean, a lot of my students, I, I, I tell when I'm teaching drums, it's another element that I do as well, yeah. is regardless of being in a big band or famous or, 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 or making money from it over here, if just having that relationship with a musical instrument till the day that you die uh, and crafting it and, and playing and mechanically through, you know, cognitive function and, and the ability to play and, and use your, 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 especially with drums, you know, mm. your four limbs in different ways is such a healthy thing to do. Yeah. So I kind of, I look at it as a, as, as more as like a health, you know, it's like a, a health diet, you know, <laughs> <laughs> music health diet, just, just yeah. doing it, yeah. you know, is so important regardless of where it gets or where it goes. Yep. It's just that part of it is just, I think will enrich you. You know, totally. there's a, there's almost a, it almost in my imagination is, is like a river that flows through everything. And, and I was speaking to another mate of mine, a, a drummer, Steve Pope, who played with Kate Miller Heidke for a while. And he, he was getting bummed out at playing Sweet Home Alabama or something. And then he read something from another drummer, basically saying that you kind of, it's all the same life force and you kind of got to respect there's something about going up there and being shitty about having to play a simple beat over three chords, the whole song, and you get sort of bummed out by it, but then you kind of, it turns around that you're actually disrespecting the the life force by kind of being mad at that thing. So you kind of have to, and he, when he, and he mentioned that, and I've never had a problem with, with, I mean, I've never really been, I had a problem with playing songs in cover bands at any point really that much before, but it made me really think about giving everything space and respecting the process and respecting the music enough to not treat it poorly. It's like a, it's almost like a self-respect thing. Maybe even if I think about it some, some ways, you know, like it's. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. And for me, it's interesting before this whole COVID thing hit, when I was doing a couple of gigs before it, 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 it crashed, what we do in terms of our job and live environment was the musicians I was playing with, we were, you know, we were doing, um, what songs there? Some Fleetwood Mac songs, and you know, some Rolling Stone songs, or whatever they were, cover songs, whatever. Yeah. But there was a little bit of that kind of drudgery, you know, from someone in the, in the band, and 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 there was, um, and I, I I made some comment about, um, we'll just you know be very thankful that we've got something um, that we can play right now and and enjoy, even though you're not you know it's not really meeting your enjoyment whatever right yeah. now but you never know you know it's like it, it, you might find anyway we couldn't play obviously when this covert thing hit and it was the last time we played and yeah. it was kind of like you know i think that that penny kind of really dropped to me on a, even on a bigger spectrum a bigger lens so to speak you know it was like even though we were talking about that and it was kind of quite you know frugal in in some regards Yep. the power of the truth of that was magnified when this whole thing happened. Yeah. It was like, don't take it for granted, you know, like even just that, you know, playing in that RSL in the back corner, you know, totally. no one's really listening and, you, and you're playing a song that, you know, everyone knows is a great song and everything, but it's, it's you know, it's it's not up, you know, in front of 1,500 people 
you know, playing a cog song, which you've yep. written, you know, it's a different experience. But at the end of the day, you know, the fortunate position of just playing and communicating and, 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 and having that was, I just am so grateful that, um, you know, the experiences that I have playing music, um, and I've had playing music have, have, have really been a big part of my life because now obviously not doing it, you know, you really get to have that feeling of, 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 wow, you know, something's been taken away, you know, did I take that for granted, you know? Yeah. And I think there's a lot of musicians would be asking about, you know, themselves some of those questions, you know. Oh, totally. I mean, it's, yeah, wow. I mean, considering also it's been such a massive part of your life for so long as well, you know. From yeah, it's like breathing. Early. Yeah. <laughs> Basically like breathing, yeah. You you've know, dive down into the ocean, you're like, all right, this is all right. We're doing okay at the moment, but I'm going to have to come up and breathe sometime really soon. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly <laughs> right. And, and if I hadn't been kind of doing the doing the kind of every Tuesday night cover band rehearsal thing with the, yeah. the Faith No More thing, which has been great too because I took that on and I played like, you know, Mike, who who in, in, in the in the band Faith No More, he plays open-handed. So I thought it was a good opportunity to actually play left-handed. Or you know, lead with the left hand on the hi hat, and then play open handed. So and set the kit up exactly like he sets it up, kind of which reminds me of what I used to do when I was younger. Yeah. So it, it's kind of, you know, all those layers are still still there, and and it's yeah. it's it's still a lot of fun to work with and play with, um, right. and and it keeps you you know it keeps you kind of exercising parts of yourself that um, you wouldn't necessarily do before, and it's a new experience and keeps you playing. Yeah up and strong and, and coming from a different angle. So, you know, that opportunity was, was really, really great to kind of foster that. What's the, um, I'd be, go I'd be no, going nuts if I didn't have the connection, you know, if I'll I didn't have it. that connection to, to play music with everything that's going on with the, the covert stuff, it'd, it'd just be, just be a nightmare not, yeah. not being able to do it. You know, I, I'm lucky to have this space here, you know, as well. Well, that's a, I think it's a pretty good note to maybe, um, I'll just ask you a couple of little quick, quick questions, yeah. you know, like, um, oh yeah, I wanted to get the social, do you, do you know what the social handles are for the faith, for FNM band? Uh, it's just that basically yeah. FNM. Yeah. That's, that's cool. the, basically the Instagram. There's a, there's a yeah, Facebook, cool. which we haven't fired up, but, um, yeah, we're hopefully going to, if things open up, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be putting it out there. So, and it's, it's a great band. It's got some really good musicians in it who, you know, yeah. I mean, obviously it was kind of like, okay, how's this going to sound? How's it going to, how's, how's it going to trans come through, you know, in terms of like it really having the integrity of, of yeah. that type of sound. And, and, and I think it's, I think it's a great representation and it's a good, um, as we like to say, uh, in, in, in the band, you know, it's, it's celebrating the, the, the sound of, of yeah. Faith No More, you know. In, in that regard I mean I don't think a lot of those bands too uh, from overseas are going to be coming this way in, in any time soon so you know as musicians if we can keep playing the great songs and the great music which provides the great you know sound and experience to, to bring joy and happiness that's that's a yep. good thing absolutely I mean and, and it's, it's that, that I was just talking to another mate about that Slipknot tribute that surfacing band I mean there there's a couple of those high level tribute bands that are actually doing really great jobs of, of the, the repertoire, you know? So it's, mm. you know, I don't think, I think it's really a really worthy endeavor if it's done the right way. Well, one thing, one thing that's just come to mind is that when I did the, the Led Zeppelin one at the state theater in Sydney and there was 1500 people, they, they, they all paid 50, 60 bucks a ticket, 1500. There was no one from Led Zeppelin there on the stage. And what it, what it, what it said to me was this is that it's not about, the pl yeah. it's not about it's it's about the music you know the 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 person who wrote it yes it's obviously going to add value and, and it's going to be more integral to to the sound and the way it's played or delivered or whatever else but really people just want to hear a good song yeah and otherwise cover bands wouldn't exist and good you know it's it's all about music and it's all about good music and it's yeah. all about you know uh, uh, projecting that and and keeping it um keeping it uh, rolling on and playing and, 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 and in the, the space and, yep. you know, um, and that was really, that was really great to kind of come to that realization that, you know, it's not, 
it's not about the archetype. It's about, it's about the music. Yeah. You know, and we can all enjoy it if it's delivered well and it's got good conviction and, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you know, it, it's like, why not? You know, and if it's a place of employment, they're going to compete, keep people happy and employed. I mean, that's a good thing, you know. Places of employment's good, you know. Well, I hope that I hope you can like I'm I'm sort of dreaming of the day that you guys can do a Frankie show, proper like come down and maybe that's not the. No, actually, no. That's that's what I want to say. I'd like to see you guys come down and pull that show into a, you know, that little stinky room and. Uh, right. Oh, what the Faith No More one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'd love to do a little bit of touring. We've talked about that, so that that would be that would be fun. Yeah, it'd be really learn really all fun. the effort to learn all the uh, to learn the repertoire and to do all that practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, which has been quite a lot of work, but um, and yeah. it really, you know, I was never really. I mean, I loved Faith No More when I heard it. I really liked it. Always liked it, but I was I was never a fan in terms of like going out and buying the music and stuff. It was just yeah. like when I heard it, I liked it, and I knew they were a great band and. Yeah. But it wasn't like, like when I got into Helmet or Soundgarden or, yeah. you know, Midnight Oil or something like that. It was, for, but now having the relationship with it, it's just like, it's just been so great. It's like a new, and I mean, I'm, these are songs that are 25, 30 years old, totally. you know, some of them or whatever. It's like, it's like having a new relationship, like what we were saying before, a good riff's a good riff, you know, and it should last and transcend the, the, the time space and continuum you know it's like it doesn't matter you know it's a good riff's a good riff you're not going to poo poo you know immigrant song riff are you you know no absolutely not, well this is a perfect perfect well, you know it's 2001 now you know it's like <laughs> you know, 2000 fucking doesn't mean anything anymore because it's an old riff it's like no nah. it's like <laughs> it's, the, it's the perfect segue because i'm calling the i'm going to call the podcast riffing and i always yeah, want, I want to ask like everyone's that. yeah i want to ask everyone's favorite riff as a final question Favorite riff? Whoa! What a what a can of worms that one is. I know. Um, oh no! You've just like because I love playing guitar too. So I'm such a you know. Um, well, I, I always say that one too. Like for some reason, it always comes up the immigrant song. You know that yeah. riff. Don't you go, dang it! It's so it's so easy, but it's just yeah. so. But I mean, you know, he that came from his creative imagination and 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 it's i mean there's so many good riffs glenn i mean oh, God, I where do you start that's so hard i was that's, um, that's really really hard um doing that same thing when i'm like oh, i'm gonna have to think about how if someone asks me what i what i think i'm like oh god i don't even know mm. so. oh yeah it's 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 almost it's almost too hard to i don't know i, no, I, I, I can't, can't, can't i can't that's a good one. yeah that's a great one yeah, you got you got me thinking though. I'll be going away pretty much <laughs> thinking all night about that. I, I guess it's just so had, much great riffs that have just given me so much joy over a long period oh, yeah, of time. Totally. I was funny, like my mate, uh, I, I did one call with James from Bare Bones, like a hardcore band down here, and he uh, he mentioned uh, I'm Broken by Pantera. And I'm like, yeah, that's a stunker. Um, yeah. But I, uh, for me, it seems like all the riffs that I like are like, not intro riffs, but more like middle riffs. Like it's almost the place that they occupy in the song that I really dig. Like I was thinking like the break stuff riff by Limp Biscuit or. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's some good ones there that some of those on that album are really good ones. Yeah. Totally. Or the end riff of Stockholm syndrome by Muse. Yeah. 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 There's, you know, yeah. like, uh, and it's because of where it occurs in the, in the song that makes you look, makes sure. Just yeah. Over the top. Yeah. <laughs> oh, riffs, and they keep coming too. That's the amazing thing. We keep we, it's like this. It's like the holy grail. It's like a quest, you know, that all the <laughs> musicians and guitar players have is just like a quest for that riff, you know. Oh, totally. Yeah, and because it means so much, and it just brings so much fun, you know, and joy, you know. <laughs> That's great. That's great Smile on the old face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want. Well, thank you so much for being uh, for being on the podcast, Lucius. This is a this exciting little time for me. New sort of branching out, trying a few new things. So this yeah, is, this is really grab good. it by the horns, mate, and, and yeah. go hard with it. That's great. I think riffing is a really great thing. You, you know a lot of people, and I think you know there's going to be a lot of people that would love to share their experiences and their ideas. And you know, yeah. um, we need something like that here too. I don't think you know we've we've kind of got anything that's kind of homegrown Australian coming from that that thing. So such a legacy. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, mate. 
that's all right. No worries. I mean, it's just we just have such a great legacy of music in the country that a lot of people aren't even aware of, you know. So, mm. it's, uh, and it just all these friendships over years. It's just great to actually sit down and be able to talk about the stuff that we clearly all think about all the time. So, mm. yeah. yeah so. Absolutely. My awesome. pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah.